Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, the beauty of mathematics, part 30. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the Black Friday sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. That sale is ending on December 1st. So make sure you check it out. We have several different tiers, including one of which is, is free. So check it out. Link is in the description below and the pinned comment. Well, we now find ourselves in December of 2022. And, you know, this, of course, is an interesting month and an interesting time for the cryptocurrency asset class because while history does not necessarily have to repeat itself, we have seen major bottoms in the cryptocurrency asset class occur around this time period. If we think back to the three prime, the, the three main bear markets that we can look at, <coughs> the one in 2018 ended in December, the one in 2014 actually ended in January of 2015, and then the one in 2011 actually ended in November. So it's sort of that season that we've historically seen major bottoms within the asset class. Now, that's not to say that it has to happen you know, right around now. So let's just say that, but it is at least something to to consider. Another reason why December uh, is is interesting for me is because my wife is actually due with our fourth kid in December, right? So this month, probably within the next week or two. So you know, my apologies in advance if I if I put out fewer videos in in December. But I'm sure, if, as anyone with kids knows, I mean, it, it can get quite. Um, uh, quite time consuming, especially right after they're born. And, you know, I mean, I think the baby's probably going to come in like two weeks or so um, based on the, you know, based on the due date. But the first three kids, um, you know, they're the, 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 the timeline, they always came a little bit earlier than the, than the previous one. So like the, the length at which she was pregnant before she gave birth. So I've, 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 I'm thinking about presenting my theory to her on, on shortening cycles, but we'll see. Probably probably we'll see this new kid here in the next week or two, and so the videos will be a little bit less um, uh, common probably for just a little while, but we'll, we'll take it one step at a time. Now, as of December 1st, 2022, the total cryptocurrency market capitalization is coming in at $829 billion. Whereas the fair value logarithmic regression trend line is coming in at 1.86 trillion. This represents an undervaluation of approximately 54%. And so, again, you might wonder, you know, this looks like maybe the Bitcoin chart. And this is, as always before, this is the, this is the total cryptocurrency market cap, not just Bitcoin, even though it, it can often look like just the price chart for Bitcoin. And... The reason you see these sort of lines going across your screen is because, you know, we've talked about this a lot, is that when you have an asset class like cryptocurrency or really any asset class that's being in the, in the, in the process of being capitalized, where it's, you know, we're figuring out what the utility is, we're figuring out, you know, what the, what the adoption timeline really looks like, the more spectacular moves tend to occur early on. And, and as the cycles go on, the returns generally diminish, right? This is a, you know, this is something we've talked about since 2019 that we should see diminishing returns from one cycle to another. Um, I mean, this is, you know, this is this obviously makes sense. It's why, you know, it's why we speculated back in 2019 that we would not, you know, we were not going to be going to, you know, some of these higher valuations that people were hoping for. I think a lot of us were hoping to go above 69k, but it again, it is one of those things that diminishing returns is just something we have to have to accept. And while it might be somewhat disappointing to think about diminishing returns in an asset class, there still is a lot of money, right, to be made. I mean, like, if you think about it, like to say that no money could have been made in 2020 and 2021, just because we are experiencing diminishing returns, which is simply, right, not true, right? There's still, still you can do quite well. Um, the other thing to consider, too, is you know, when when you're early on and the market cap is only like 1 million or 10 million or 100 million, it's a lot easier to see a 10x or 100x in a shorter time frame than it is when the asset class as a whole is say 1 trillion, right? Like it's just going to take longer to ultimately see those same types of returns just because it takes a lot more money to move the market, right? It, it just takes a lot more. And that's why oftentimes people don't really like Bitcoin so much because 
they like to chase the outsized gains in the altcoin market. But in the same way that altcoins can outperform Bitcoin in, in say, a bull market, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them can underperform in a bear market. And one of the reasons is there's just not as much liquidity and, and the use cases of a lot of altcoins is really, you know, they're, they're sort of glamorized in the bull market. And then you get to the bear market and you're like, well, you know, what does this thing do, you know? Um, so you have to consider that. But again, you know, th this is why we use logarithmic regression is because as, as we move forward through time, you sort of see this slowly fold over and it, it doesn't go up quite as fast as, as time continues to go on. So again, I mean, as of today, the market cap of the entire asset class is 829 billion. The fair value, according to the red logarithmic regression trend line, which again is a monotonically increasing function, is 1.86 trillion, representing an undervaluation of approximately 54%. But remember, the asset class can stay undervalued for years in the same way that it can stay overvalued for years. If you look back, you know, we were undervalued from like 2015 until early 2017 before we made a run to the new, you know, to the top of the screen logarithmic regression band. And then even <laughs> even last bear market, we, you know, were mostly undervalued from late 2018 until late 2020. And so we we came below this undervaluation region, you know, in in like, you know, like mid 2022, maybe like early to mid 2022. And while I know a lot of people would like for us to just immediately go back to being overvalued, history shows us that this is not often the case. And I mean, even 2011, where we popped back above overvaluation, we still came back down and we're still well within the undervaluation territory for a good part of a year before we went back to being overvalued. And so just simply looking at prior bear markets, I, I think it's important to understand that there's this time-based component that we often don't like to, to admit, right? Like we don't we don't really want to think about it because if we do, it's just like, ah, we have to wait. Like we have to wait and wait and wait. And um, but I mean, like, look, I mean, I, I, I think it's important for everyone to always have their expectations in check, sort of have the understanding as to what is the most likely outcome. And arguably, the most likely outcome is that the entire asset class as a whole is still nowhere close to being going back into the overvalued territory. Right. Like we could spend another six months, 12 months, 18 months in the undervaluation territory before you see us ever have a chance to go back to being, you know, quote unquote, overvalued, right? So again, we can be undervalued for a long time. And while 54% undervalue might sound like a lot, and it kind of is, right? I mean, if history is any indication, the last two bear markets, we actually made our way at some point all the way down to the, the, the downtrend line, right? The green, the lower green regression line. Now, in 2015, it took until sort of like August. So like, you know, equating that today would be say like Q3 of 2023. But note that we sort of just went sideways into it. We came down and then we went sideways until we hit it. And in 2018, we kind of came down and we went sideways until we hit it. We, had, we actually hit it at a higher level than we bottomed out in 2018. But the reason we were more undervalued was because we assume that the fair value of the asset class is always increasing, right? I mean, I know it's like a... Uh, a, a dubious assumption, right? At best, right? It's a dubious assumption. Speaking of, we do have the dubious speculation t-shirts for sale as well. You can find a link to that in the description below as well. But I digress, right? Um, you know, when we look at this, we're still off the green line. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there. And there's plenty of ways that we could go about getting there, right? I mean, it could just be we go down into it. We could, could just be that we go sideways for you know, another nine months or something until we hit it. Maybe we pop back up and then come back down. There's so many different ways we can get there. If you look at, at the history of, of the asset class, we've come up to the top of this green line three times. Unfortunately, this most recent bull market, we didn't quite make it there, right? We, we sort of had two more tempered peaks, arguably an artifact of, of the deteriorating macro conditions that we've spent the entire year talking about, right? I mean, like high inflation, and, and, and dealing with the Fed's response. And I mean, Powell came out, <laughs> Powell came out today and was, you know, was more dovish than I've heard him be in, <laughs> in basically like a year. Um, but, you know, they're still raising interest rates, right? I mean, and of course, risk assets like it in the short term, which makes sense. But I, I still think that, you know, once we get into 2023, we, we have to figure out what are the effects of all these rate hikes that they did in 2022. And then we'll see, you know, kind of we'll see where where things where things are. We'll see we'll see what's what and who's who. <clears throat>
if you take the percent difference between the market cap and the red trend line, you get this, okay? And the whole idea is that we go through periods of overvaluation and undervaluation. And historically, when you're in sort of this green area down here, when it's below one, meaning it's like undervalued, 100% equals at the trend line in this case, that tends to be a, 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 a decent accumulation zone for the next cycle. Now, if you told people this, right, like if you told someone that like, you know, buying right here is a great accumulation zone for the next cycle, and then we just continue to go down for a while, and then we went sideways for a while, they don't necessarily feel like it was a good time. And it takes like maybe a year or two for it to actually feel like that was a good investment. But you can see that in 2015, we basically came down to this lower regression trend line or the, the regression trend line. And we came down to these, you know, 65% undervaluation. And then we more or less just stayed there for a year or so. We sort of rode that lower regression band until we, we popped back up. And so I think there's a case to be made that the entire asset class as a whole is getting relatively close to that, you know, that sort of that just sideways zone where it, you know, we, we come down and then we just go sideways for a while. And by the way, for it to go sideways, the entire asset class actually has to slowly trend up because the fair value is always increasing. So if we stay sideways, then we become more undervalued. Now, history shows us that while we are 54% undervalued, most bottoms occur lower than that, right? About 65% undervalued. So I know, I mean, again, like 54% sounds great. And, you know, long term, there's probably some merit to saying that it's a great level. In the short term, right, who really knows? Like three months from now, four months from now, could we continue to go down and then go sideways or something? Yeah, it's certainly a possibility. And I think you need to consider that. In the grand scheme, people who have accumulated in these regions with like a two-year outlook or a two- to three-year outlook have done quite well. It's just in the short term, it's really anyone's guess, right, as to exactly uh, the direction it's, it's going to go. And of course, it's anyone's guess no matter what. I mean, there's no guarantee of anything. Of course, it's enough financial advice, but we're just looking at what history at what history tells us. Um, so, you know, if you go look at, at where we are right now, and if you take the more pessimistic approach, which would be we go straight down into the green regression band, like late this year, or like, you know, in the next few weeks, or sometime in the first quarter of 2023, then, <laughs> then it means the asset class goes down to four to five hundred billion, right? Again, right now it's at eight hundred twenty-nine billion. So if it just goes down straight into it, this is what I would, you know, more or less consider to be like sort of like a worst-case scenario um, of of just sort of going down straight into that into that area. I'm not. I mean, of course, at the end of the day, I mean, this is just a guide. Nothing is is out of the question. But that is one. That's sort of the bearish outlook would just be sort of going straight down into the lower regression band. And, and sort of ripping the Band-Aid off, right? Um, another outlook is would be a more neutral one, which again, the further down we go in price, the more, you know, the more interest I think people should show towards the neutral case. The neutral case is that we just go sideways until we hit it. And if that were, the, if that were to happen, it would take until basically Q3 of 2023, which is interesting because the next halving is in early 2024. Now listen, <coughs> There's always a debate about the having, and you know, is that what sends Bitcoin into the bull market or is it not? And I think um, it's interesting because I think a lot of the people that that have been in Bitcoin for a long time, I, I think it's only natural to assume that the having is what kickstarts the bull market. And I've also seen a lot of people who really study the markets really, really hard and are exposed to like you know traditional markets and other things as well, and they say the, ha the having has nothing to do with it; it's priced in and um, and it only matter, you know, only the thing that matters is access to cheap capital. And, you know, if the Fed has high interest rates and they're still rolling off assets from the balance sheet, Bitcoin's still not going anywhere. <coughs> I'm sort of actually in between. I mean, <coughs> I think that having access to cheap capital is important. Um, and, and, and liquidity is, is actually really important for crypto. Um, but at the same time, I, I think the having provides a really great narrative. And, and it, it just happens to be that historically, you know, once the having comes back around, like, you know, the the, the, the macro has, has looked a bit better. And I mean, hopefully that'll happen this time too. But my point is, is I, I just want people to have their expectations in check, right? I mean, and today, of course, everyone's excited because Bitcoin's back over 17K. But three weeks ago, you know, if you had told someone three weeks ago when Bitcoin was, <laughs> when Bitcoin was at 21K, that everyone was going to be celebrating with a 17K Bitcoin, 
and and once again, you know, calling the bottom for the tenth time in this bear market, you would have sort of rolled your eyes, like, all right, well, if we went down to 17k, that's a bearish thing. Um, <clears throat> but of course, I mean, we you know we are uh, we we suffer from short term memory loss in the crypto market, and so you know, yesterday's FUD price is today's FOMO price, and and the cycle goes on. But yeah, I mean, the the more neutral outlook is just sort of going sideways until you hit it. But again, it's going to take. I mean, it would take until mid 2023 mid to late 2023 for us to get there, uh, the lower part. And do note that both of the prior bear market slash accumulation phases <coughs> did eventually hit the green band, um, which would be about a 65% undervaluation. Right now we're at 54%. So as always, you know, <coughs> my general hope is, is and goal for the asset class is to reach that $10 trillion milestone. Remember the last cycle, we went up to, to $3 trillion. Okay, so the ultimate dream, right, is, is for us to get to that $10 trillion threshold. And <laughs> I think we will eventually make it. Um, whether we make it next cycle or not, it's probably going to depend on, on how quickly inflation comes back down and, and, and what the Fed's resolve is going to be. But hopefully, I mean, the goal, of course, is, is to get to that $10 trillion milestone, plus or minus a few trillion. And as we go to sleep at night, we cannot help but wonder what's a few trillion dollars among friends. Thank you guys for tuning in. Remember to check out the Black Friday sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium. Link's down in the description below. And that sale is ending on December 1st. So we'll see you guys next time. Bye.